Hello and welcome back to the Talking Leadership TV podcast series. Thanks for joining me. My guest today is Mary O'Brien. Mary is a passionate advocate for the Australian agriculture sector and was raised on the land. She understands the diverse challenges faced by the rural sector. After spending her whole life working in rural and remote Australia, Mary knows country blokes. She's worked with them, for them and beside them and most importantly, she knows how to talk to them. This unique perspective inspired the launch of Are You Bog Mate, which is aimed to help countrymen connect with support services and break down the stigma associated with seeking help. It all started with an article titled Are You Bog Mate, which spread far and wide, gaining international attention. This topic struck a chord and highlighted that while there are services available for suicide prevention, there is a disconnect in the way depression is being communicated to country men. Mary and her team want to fix this disconnect. Are You Bog Mate aims to boost awareness and start a conversation with the broader community about the rising issue of depression and suicide rates among men in rural areas. Mary and the team are confronting the challenges that country men face on a daily basis, talking about mental health and lighting the path to support. Thanks again for your support and enough from me, I'll hand over to Mary. Mary, thank you for joining me on today's podcast. So uh, I've gone with the definition for this, uh, your leadership pathway. So let's start at the beginning if we can. Give me some sense of your leadership and its beginnings. Well, I, I guess that's probably a difficult question for me to answer because I don't really see myself as a leader. I guess what I'm doing now, I'm I'm trying to do the best that I can, but it, it all happened quite by accident and all I did was write an opinion piece. So I guess it probably started from brutal honesty, uh, which I'm reasonably well known for, uh, possibly too honest, but that's, that's I guess, what got me into the, the mental health space and specifically the rural men's mental health space that I'm in now is just writing an article that was um, open and honest. Yeah, thank you for that. Oh, and I will share that link to the article in the podcast description for um, to get help people engage with where you're at. Um, what was the driver for you to write what you wrote? And so, um, and why I ask this is, outside of looking in, I see I personally see you in a leadership space, but um, that's just a personal view. For me, and it's interesting that in my travels and in the discussions I've had, I've had a few people come on and say they're reluctant leaders or don't um, don't label themselves that way, which is fine. But what what drew you to writing the article and then the profile and notoriety that came with that? Well, I guess the um, the work that I was doing in in spray application was taking me around the country, mainly speaking directly to men in sheds, rural men. And we unfortunately had two suicides in my region of, of reasonably prominent men. And I guess it was the the shock and, and watching the community try and deal with that that sort of spurred this. And, and I'm not sure why these two men in particular, maybe it was the role I had travelling around, you know, vast areas of Australian broadacre agriculture that I just decided to look into it because I've certainly lost people close to me throughout my life to suicide. So th this was certainly not my first experience with suicide and and it wasn't that it was particularly close to me, but maybe it was that broader picture of, well, wow, you know, I travel Australia talking in agriculture and we've just lost two men in three weeks over Christmas, which is a pretty tough time to lose people at the best of times, regardless of how they, how they pass. So I, I guess it was that, desperation to say well what's going on here and find out so I went on a bit of a journey of discovery to I guess upskill myself and and look for different things you know was there a course I could do was there something I could read how could I know if someone was going through this and potentially what could I do to stop it so I guess I went looking for um, ways to upskill myself and I, I, everything I read I just didn't agree with and sort of thought well that's not a how these blokes work. That's rubbish. Um, used a harsher word than that, but essentially I just read all this information written by people with qualifications in that space because to this date I have none. Um, I've, I've got a science degree and Masters of Ag and et cetera, but nothing in mental health. And so I just sat down and I wrote an article and I just told people what I thought and what I thought of 
I guess, the, the mainstream approach to rural men's mental health. And um, it turned out a few people agreed with me. So that's, yeah, I guess that's what spurred me to write that article was watching the grief and loss in my own community. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. And it it, um, it helps build a context to uh, the work that it is that you're doing. And um, you said that you've, you've travelled a little bit for the role that you're in now. And I'm, I'll... I'll make a guess here, educated guess, that you've probably met some leaders in your travel. So taking all that together, how would you define leadership, Mary? Look, I've certainly met a lot of leaders of, of different um, different colours, different stripes and different persuasions over the, my time. And I guess, uh, yeah, I certainly meet some in this role, but I've probably, um, if I can bravely say met better ones in in before I started doing this and I think um for me and for what I see in other people and I certainly don't think that I embody this at all but to me um good leaders inspire others to do their best or to do better or to be brave or to take you know take steps that they may not have if they didn't have that support so um you know a few great leaders that spring to mind for me that's one of the things that's common I guess across them is that they don't just tell you what to do they encourage you to do it um, and they'll take your ideas on board and they're I guess they probably um, listen and yeah they really do inspire people to you know you can do that way you go great good on you so um, I guess that's something that you know has happened for me personally that um, people that I respect and look up to have have done that to me and certainly with the Aya Bogged mate thing said, you know, well, you can do this because I was like, I don't even do this. Let's, I don't do mental health. That's not what I do. And they're like, yeah, you do. Where you go. I'm like, okay. So otherwise um, it would have just been an article and I'd still be answering phone calls about it but not doing anything about it. So it was that um, having people around me who encourage me to do something or to, I guess, aspire to to change, make a change. Thank you for that, Mary. It, it, um, I was just thinking for a second there, this kind of links in uh, very nicely to some previous discussions I've had around the process of lifelong learning. So an ability to want to learn and get engaged with whatever it is you need to, to help you either in a professional context or in a personal context or whichever world it is that you're um, in at that point in time and it sounds like you had that that light bulb moment to get involved in the mental health space you wrote the article you wrote obviously and I've read it it it, it read like it came from the heart and from experience and it's something that resonates with people so when you write that way I think it hits people where they live if you get my meaning there that they connect with what you're saying they may not have had the same experiences and I think once that kicked off, it, it sounds like you were um, hungry to learn more, and that's that's necessarily another trait of effective leadership. In, in, in my estimation, this is just my um, a personal view. Do you do you believe that your experiences in your current position and those in previous uh, work roles that you've had have shaped your thinking around leadership? Is that something that you gave a lot of attention to when you're dealing in the area of, of preventing suicide and talking about uh, better mental health, uh, particularly among blokes? I guess leadership is not something that I ever focus on or ever really have focused on, I guess. Um, to me, I think everyone should aspire to do the best they can every day. Uh, some days don't go so well, but at least if you can get into bed at night and say, look, I did the best I can, with the knowledge and resources and skills that I have today, you know what, tomorrow I might do better. Next week I might do even better, but today I did the best I can. So I think it's probably, um, yeah, it's, it's more about everybody having a, having a go. And so I, I guess I've never really thought too much about leadership. I guess it's, it's more about those qualities and traits in people. And so uh, uh, integrity and honesty are probably the, the two most important things that, I could um, see as as traits for anyone and particularly for leaders that if you can't be honest with people about, you know, 
how they are going or how you are going or, or the goals that you want to achieve. Like if you can't be honest with people and say, you're actually doing a pretty rubbish job. Let's see if we can fix this. Or, you know, you're doing a great job. You know, keep that keep that up. Um, so I think honesty and integrity are, are probably the, the most key things that I guess everyone can strive to and, and not just leaders um, or aspiring leaders. And I think a lot of people are probably, yeah, leaders and they don't even know that. So um, that because they have those qualities that, well, that I value anyway in, in leaders, integrity and honesty. Yeah, um, you, look, I, I couldn't disagree. In fact, I, I think from experience, and uh, this is a personal view, of course, that it's the application of those skill sets in your life. Uh, like you said, being, having integrity, having, sorry, be, being known as someone of integrity and honesty is a good, they're good human traits to have irrespective of whether or not you're in a leadership role. But I, I think where the jump is to leadership is the application of those things. So are you acting with integrity and high ethics in your role as a leader? Are you being honest so that the people around you know that there's no BS in in what you're saying? Because um, I, I think Aussies in particular, we pick up disingenuous, um, non-genuine people very quickly <laughs> in our travels. Um that, that aside, and I'm not saying that that's not important, uh, one thing that came to mind, and I, I, like you, freely admit I don't have experience here, but the word resilience tends to come up a lot as, as a trait that effective leaders have. Is that something you've seen a lack of or lack of, of skills in amongst the p- people that you've worked with, not just in your current role, but in your travels as a professional person, studies and all the rest of it, is resilience something that is is something that you've um, taken some time to engage with? Look, not really. I actually think it probably needs a bit of a holiday. It gets it's probably the most used word, and particularly in the mental health space, resilience, resilience. We've got to build resilience, and um, I think if you, um, I, I, know, I don't know. Maybe this is all part of the the big picture resilience thing, but it's not a word that I like to use a lot. Um, you know, we see communities across Australia that are affected by bushfires or floods or droughts or whatever, and everybody's on television and, you know, the mainstream media is saying, oh, you know, but these country people, they're resilient. And we've got politicians standing up there saying we're resilient. And you know what? Even the toughest metal has a breaking point. So I think, you know, we, we constantly expect country people in particular to be resilient. They're tough. Yeah, they are. They're bloody tough. But everybody has a breaking point, so um, I haven't. I don't. I guess I don't focus on resilience so much as um, one step at a time, and that's something that I speak about is is one step at a time that we don't have to see the whole road. Uh, and the analogy that I use is, you know, I can drive from here in Dolby to Longreach in the middle of the night when it's pitch dark because I have lights on my Ute. It doesn't matter how good those lights are when I turn them on here, I can't see Longreach. The only way I'm going to get there is to keep moving. Because even if my lights are brilliant, if I sit here and whinge that I can't see Longreach, I'm never actually going to see Longreach. So it's that just keep bodding. And if, if that's all you can do, you're only going to see a little bit of the road at a time. Sometimes you might see a bit more if the road's a bit straighter. Um, but it's that ability to keep going. So whether whether we want to define that as resilience, but it's it's giving the hope. And you know what? There are people to help you put better lights on on that vehicle to get you there. There are people to give you maps to get you there. So there's all of these things that contribute to how you get there. And I know, look, I guess that is probably building that resilience, but it's not something that I focus on a lot. Um, I guess with myself, it's probably um, do as I say, not as I do. But for me, it's like I've got a lot to do in the next week or two or the next month. I know I'm not going to get any downtime, so I'm going to swallow my cement pills and I'm going to push through because I know at the end of that I can get a break. So, um, yeah, it's – I don't know. Is that uh, just taking stock of what you can and can't managing, manage in your life and um, accepting the things you, you can manage and I guess accepting the things you can't manage as well? Is that resilience? I'm not sure. I'm not even sure I have a, a proper definition for it. Oh, and and uh, please um, don't. Uh, I didn't mean to mislead you here. I don't have a definition either. I just it's something. 
it's a term you hear a lot and it's um it's good good to get some grounding from someone who has that experience of of uh working with and and engaging with people in rural and regional australia this is um something i think that is missed sometimes particularly from city people that don't understand uh what um living outside of an urban area can mean uh the issue to that um rural and regional australia face now i've i've had some experience in rural and regional Australia, not I'm not comparing and I'm not saying mine matches yours to any degree, but yeah, it it was interesting to me that the things that I I read often on LinkedIn, the things that I do for my own research, that that resilience word tends to tends to come up quite a bit, and I think there's assumptions made about um, certain groups, and like you said, if if a rural or regional community goes through some tragic event like a bushfire or floods. Oh, they're they're resilient because they're rural and regional folk. Well, there is a, a, a I guess that that um, tipping point and recognizing where that's coming is where we need people like yourself in in the roles that you do. Um, I'll I'll call you a leader if you don't mind me saying that. You may not view yourself that way, but you need people to step up and do the things that you're talking about and. Um, without, without the formal title and definitely was being facetious before, I think the people that step up are engaging in that leadership process even though they don't have the title and you don't need it to do the process of leadership if you get where I'm coming from. And um, I'm sure you've seen those people when you've been in situations where there has been some kind of natural disaster post that process. Do, do you... Um, I guess spotting them is easy because they're the ones up front directing, getting involved, putting in the the 28 hours a day to get some stuff done and not having enough hours in the, the day to do what they need to do. Does that sound um, reflective of the what you've seen in your travels, Mary? Yeah, definitely. And I think um, I think my, I guess my really strong sense of justice. And so um this is where I guess my, my sense of justice and my brutal honesty can often clash that if I see something something wrong or something not right, I've got to say something or I've got to do something. I've got to pull somebody up and go, you know, even just people being idiots in a shopping centre, I'm like, hey, 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 knock it off. What are you doing? Like I just can't um, see injustice, you know, some little old granny getting pushed around like, no, no, wait up. Um, so it's that, that sense of justice that particularly when people go in, you know, for the throat on country people. I'm like, hang on a minute. Um, and I, you know, I do this for anyone that you don't know what crap is in their bucket. So I, in my presentations, I talk about buckets and everyone's got a bucket and we don't know what's in their bucket. So if they suddenly, you know, have a meltdown or, you know, lose their shit, if I can use that word, over something that we might think is insignificant, we actually don't know what else is in their bucket. They might have all this other stuff that we don't know about and people are like, what's wrong with them? Like, overreacting well yeah they might be but they might also have all this other stuff that we don't know about so I guess it's it's having that little bit of empathy and saying hey you know what everyone's got their cross to bear and you don't know what's what they've got and um, I think particularly with social media this it frustrates me to see these keyboard warriors and they're having a go at somebody that they have never met and and were never likely to um they're having a go at farmers or irrigators or, you know, intensive livestock or something, live export. They're having a go at something when they know nothing about the industry um, and having worked in the cotton industry for many years, I've seen this countless times. And, you know, I just throw that open door policy, come and we'll show you. Come out and talk to us and we'll show you. So, yeah, it's that uh, sense of justice and and possibly a little bit too honest. Um that uh, not politically correct, and I'll just, I guess, pull people up and say, no, hang on, that's I'm not going to have that. So uh, you can never be too honest, up. Mary. You you can never be too oh, honest. No, apparently you can. I think you can. Apparently, <laughs> um, but it's yeah. I'm just I'm prepared to stand up and swing the bat. I guess so. Yeah, and that, and that's um that that's a classic. Uh, I guess um position that that people taking a leadership stance are doing you know they're they're the ones willing to be 
um, risk takers in that space. And again, without the the formal quals and definitely experience around uh, mental health, you know, poor mental health issues, generally speaking, but from my experience, uh, having worked in the seafood industry, I, I like the analogy that you don't know what people are carrying in their bucket and you don't know when something very small is going to make it overflow and then you get that negative reaction that you might see from an individual that you might even know that you go, hey, this isn't typically like that person to be this way. You just don't know. And um, the the fact that we have people like yourself and others that are prepared to facilitate conversations and ask a simple question, you know, are you bogged or are you okay? And and um, opening up that conversation, to, it's a very difficult thing to do. And and speaking for my tribe, blokes are not good. <laughs> we're not good at having those conversations, and we're you know not good at self care, and that that um, requires some assistance and some help and people to take. Um, leading roles and and I you know I can only say thank you for the work that you do on on behalf of human beings that need that help. Let let me ask you something. Um, and again, this is from you having lived a life in in the ag and rural regional Australia. Human beings being what they are, do you believe that leaders are are born or they're made? I think we. I probably see a little mix of both, but I think as a general rule, um, probably not something I've given a lot of thought to, but I think that there's probably a very clear distinction between those that are born and those that are made. And sometimes we get some that are a, a bit of both. But I think um, I think most are probably born, to be honest. We will get some outstanding leaders who are made and never sort of planned for it or and you know accidentally ended up in the this in the leading roles that they've had um but i i think yeah that you know the, their life experience or whatever for one reason or another has um probably thrust them into that and and, and a good example that just brings to mind would be daniel morgan's parents you know they never they never meant for this they never wanted this god forbid but they've ended up being leaders in an area that they, you know, never dreamt that they would. So I guess we we do get one made like that. But I think um, there's a we probably all all know family members or friends or you know even watching small children now. There's a leader. Um, just is some a friend of mine. Her children come to mind. There is a clear leader, and she is either going to um, run a prison gang or be a CEO. Like. It's it's very distinct. So there's, um, I guess, there's some that are born and, and some that are certainly made. So um, just just to end the podcast and and thank you for sharing your um, your your journey with this with us around leadership and the work that you do. Do you in your travels do you identify uh, people that you believe can help the cause and? Can you spot talent that way in terms of, of people that can be leaders in the space in which you work to help promote what it is that you're doing? Do you do you actively see that when you engage with people? Sometimes, and I guess the we do. I certainly do get approached by a lot of people who who want to work in this space or work with me. And um, my, I'm a big believer in trust your gut. Um, you know. Don't believe your head, it, it overthinks things. Never believe your heart, it's dumb as anything. Um, trust your gut and go with your gut. And so to me, the the people who usually approach me are not the people that I want. And so I have, um, I guess, stumbled across people that I think, you know what, I actually think you might have what I'm looking for. And it, if I was looking for people, I probably wouldn't advertise because the people who applied for a job that I advertise are not the people I want. Um, and look, I've certainly had people come up and say that they want to get into something or, you know, want to get into speaking or things like that. And they, they want to lead in this space and, um, have a conversation with them and find that, you know what, there's, there's actually something else that you're really good at and you can tie this into that and, and develop a career or build something, you know, worthwhile for yourself and others through that. And so that's been actually quite interesting where, um, 
you know, I've had people say, oh, I want to be a keynote speaker. And so, you know, how do I start? And so we've been able, you know, I've been able to sort of say, well, what about this? And, and you know, what clubs are you in? And maybe start this. And so that was, that's really good. Um, but yeah, I certainly do come across people who don't even realise the difference that they're making. And I love finding those ones. And um, sometimes you just find people who, yeah, you just, you can just tell that there's something, something there and whether they're recognised for it or not. And um, yeah, so there's, there's quite a few little award things around Australia. And so I love finding people like that and just slotting them in for those sort of awards. And the next minute they get an email and go, how, do, how, how does anyone know what I do? Um, so yeah, I do keep an eye out for, for people doing something different and, and unique um, as I travel the country because there's some great stuff going on out there and it might only involve 10 people, it might involve two people, but it might involve 2,000. Um, there's some really, really good grassroots stuff happening around the country. Mayor, I appreciate that and thank you for uh, speaking with me today. Appreciate your time, mate. No problem at all. Happy to. I really, like I said, I don't see myself as a leader, but um, I certainly know some great ones. So, yeah. My thanks to Mary for sharing her leadership insight with us today. And as always, my thank you to you for supporting the podcast. If you like the content, please drop a like or subscribe. Have a great week. Look after yourselves and we'll catch everyone on the next episode of Talking Leadership TV.